The Ice Age was a brutal, unforgiving world, and at the top of the food chain lurked a predator unlike any other, the dire wolf. Towering over its modern relatives, this beast roamed the Americas in packs, its powerful jaws built for crushing bone and tearing through the flesh of massive prey. But beneath its fearsome exterior lay a mystery that baffled scientists for centuries. What truly set the dire wolf apart, and why did it vanish forever? One of the earliest recorded dire occurred in 1854 along the Ohio River near Evansville, Indiana. It ended up in the hands of geologist Joseph Granville Norwood, who passed it to paleontologist Joseph Leidy for identification. At first, they thought it belonged to an ancient wolf, labeling it Canis primivus. Over time, other big wolf bones from places like Nebraska joined the discussion. Eventually, experts realized these remains all pointed to a single extinct species. By 1858, Leidy introduced the name Canis dirus, meaning terrible wolf in Latin. Not long after, more fossil finds spread across the United States. Scientists saw that these giant wolves all shared distinct features, but they assumed they belonged under the same genus as modern wolves, coyotes, and dogs. For a time, the extinct creature was simply another member of Canis, but arguments arose once experts noticed the dire wolf's larger skull and teeth. By the early 1900s, bone fragments recovered from California's Rancho La Brea tar pits strengthened the idea that this impressive canid was far from ordinary and truly fascinating. Over time, scientists proposed changing its classification. John Campbell Merriam once suggested putting the species in a separate genus named Enochian, which means terrible dog. Yet this idea did not gain full acceptance right away. For decades, many paleontologists stuck with Canis dirus, linking it firmly to wolves. It was only in 2021, when researchers sequenced ancient DNA from dire wolf fossils, that the idea of a separate genus re-emerged with new force. This genetic breakthrough helped confirm that dire wolves were not just oversized gray wolves, but rather a long isolated lineage. Today, the recognized name for this creature is Enochion dirus, reflecting its unique path apart from living wolf species. Its story highlights how paleontology can shift when new fossils appear or modern techniques offer fresh clues. No longer lumped in with the gray wolf, the dire wolf now stands as a separate branch in the canid family. This shift in taxonomy reminds us that Earth's fossil record holds ongoing mysteries. What started as scattered bones in the mid-1800s evolved into a major paleontological puzzle, reminding us that ancient life had surprising complexities, and that puzzle still keeps growing. The dire wolf's ancestors likely emerged in North America millions of years ago, branching away from the line that gave rise to modern gray wolves and coyotes. Although many experts once assumed dire wolves came from an old-world wolf that crossed into the Americas, new DNA findings indicate a separate track. Their divergence might date back 5.7 million years or more. This suggests that dire wolves were not simply larger versions of existing wolves, but part of a distinct lineage that thrived on this continent for a very long time. Fossils of older canines, such as Yukion, spread from North America to Eurasia millions of years earlier. But the branch leading to dire wolves stayed here, adapting to conditions that were different from those faced by gray wolves overseas. Over centuries, repeated climate shifts and migrations shaped canid evolution. Gray wolves and coyotes arrived in mid-latitude North America later, during the late Pleistocene. By then, dire wolves were already established. Their isolation may have limited genetic exchange with other canids, helping them remain a separate group. One remarkable aspect is how similar dire wolves looked to gray wolves, even though they weren't close relatives. This phenomenon, known as convergent evolution, often occurs when separate species adapt to the same types of prey and habitats. Over time, these pressures produce matching shapes and features. For dire wolves, living beside gray wolves in North America led to many parallels in body plan. Yet deep genetic work shows dire wolves were more closely linked to animals like African jackals than to the gray wolf or dog lineages. Despite their long separation, dire wolves and gray wolves did share North American turf. Fossils found in places like the La Brea tar pits reveal both species occupying the same region for thousands of years. However, no sign of interbreeding appears in the genetic record. This suggests that dire wolves kept to their lineage. 
different breeding cycles or genetic barriers. That separation shaped their fate when ice sheets melted and environments changed. While gray wolves spread and adapted, dire wolves faced new obstacles. Their distinct evolutionary journey would come to a close before it could indeed leave an enduring mark on North American prehistory. The dire wolf was similar in size to the largest modern gray wolf, especially those in the northwest of North America. Still, many individuals weighed between 60 and 68 kilograms, with some reaching up to 68 kilograms or more. A few might have topped 90 kilograms, although the absolute maximum remains uncertain. Because of its heavier build, the dire wolf often appeared more robust than today's wolves. Its limbs, skull, and teeth were proportionally larger, giving it a bulky frame that hinted at a life spent hunting big prey. Its skull could measure over 30 centimeters, with wide zygomatic arches and a noticeable sagittal crest on top. This shape housed strong jaw muscles, allowing powerful bites. The dire wolf's snout was also broad. Despite these hefty features, it likely had a slightly smaller brain cavity compared to a gray wolf of the same size. Researchers suggest it sacrificed some cranial capacity for added biting strength. Though it walked on four legs like a typical canid, certain bones in its forelimbs and hindlimbs were thicker, matching its heavyset physique. Interestingly, fossil evidence indicates at least two subspecies, Enochion deer Gildai, found mostly in western regions like California and Mexico, and Enochion dirus dirus, discovered east of the Rocky Mountains. The western form tended to have shorter legs and was about 10 to 15 percent smaller. The eastern subspecies had somewhat longer limbs, suggesting a stronger runner. Both types, however, displayed large, sturdy skulls and strong jaws. Their foot structure was also slightly broader than that of many gray wolves, which might have helped support their heavier bodies on rough ground. Scientists note that the dire wolf canines were not just long, they were also more flexible than those of modern canids. This odd flexibility might have let them grip struggling prey without easily snapping their teeth. Their premolars and molars were well designed for slicing through muscle and possibly cracking bone. Taken together, all these features point to a predator built for power. Though it shared the wolf label for many years, the dire wolf's morphology shows a distinct creature, one that combined raw strength with specialized traits, ideal for ice age survival, bite force, dentition and feeding adaptations. A key feature that sets the dire wolf apart is its impressive bite force. When researchers compared the bite force of various carnivores, they discovered the dire wolf had one of the strongest pound-for-pound -pound bites among placental mammals. Its large temporalis muscles, anchored on the high sagittal crest, generated enough force to grip and tear through tough hides. Even massive predators like Smilodon did not consistently top the dire wolf in raw bite efficiency when size is taken into account. Much of this ability comes from the dire wolf's specialized dentition. Its carnassial teeth, which are the cutting molars, were larger than those of most canids, providing more surface area for slicing. This design suggests a hypercarnivorous diet, meaning it consumed over 70% meat. Stable isotope studies from tar pit fossils confirm that dire wolves often fed on big herbivores. Their strong bite and specialized teeth helped them tackle animals like ancient horses, prehistoric bison, and camels. Now and then, they may have scavenged or fed on smaller mammals too. Tooth breakage is common in predators, and dire wolves were no exception. At sites such as the La Brea tar pits, many dire wolf fossils show worn or fractured teeth, especially the incisors and canines. Scientists think this stems from gnawing on large bones or fighting with prey that resisted fiercely. Some studies link higher tooth breakage rates to times of food stress when predators devoured carcasses more completely. A high breakage rate may indicate fierce competition for limited resources toward the end of the Pleistocene. Yet even with these challenges, the dire wolf was well equipped to handle demanding hunts. Its flexible canines likely reduced the risk of teeth snapping during a kill. Studies of tooth enamel also suggest it could strip flesh down to the bone, leaving little behind. By combining raw biting strength with advanced shearing molars, dire wolves could consume a wide variety of prey. This adaptability hints at a predator that thrived on abundance, but also managed lean times by fully utilizing every meal, revealing its place as a top Ice Age carnivore. Most canids are social to some degree, and fossil evidence suggests dire wolves were no different. Large numbers of dire wolves remain in single spots, such as the La Brea tar pits, imply they often approach trapped animals together. A lone predator might hesitate around hazardous tar seeps, but packs can be drawn by the promise of a substantial meal. Once a big herbivore got stuck, a group of dire wolves might gather, each hoping to claim a share of the prize. Sadly for many, the sticky asphalt also ensnared them. 
Studies of dire wolf skeletons show limited sexual dimorphism, which suggests pair bonding much like modern wolves. In many wolf species, an alpha pair produces pups, and older offspring stick around to help. This arrangement fosters cooperation, letting them tackle large prey. The same might have been true for dire wolves, who probably raised pups in a group. Bonds among pack members would have strengthened their chances in fierce encounters with big animals like mammoths or giant sloths, although some of these hunts likely led to lethal injuries. One intriguing clue to pack behavior comes from toothwear patterns. Certain dire wolf remains have heavily worn incisors, possibly from repeated gripping and pulling during group kills. When multiple wolves latch onto a struggling bison, for instance, they might wear down their front teeth faster than a solitary hunter. The high number of individuals in certain tar pit deposits might also indicate intense competition. If a few dire wolves discovered a trapped horse, more could have quickly joined, leading to crowding, fights for access, and even more dire wolves getting stuck. Though we cannot watch them in action, many scientists imagine dire wolf packs were complex. Parents probably taught their pups to hunt, just like modern wolves do. Social calls and scents might have coordinated the group over wide distances. Each pack's size could vary, but some estimates range from a dozen to 30 members. This level of social structure allowed dire wolves to spread widely and exploit different habitats. Whether stalking open grasslands or forest edges, they likely relied on teamwork to bring down prey that far exceeded their weight. Dire wolves roamed across a large part of the Americas. Fossils have been found in regions as far south as Bolivia and Peru, and as far north as parts of Canada. They appeared comfortable in various environments, from arid savannas to grassy plains. Some remains even come from slightly forested mountains. Their range extended throughout the United States, with notable finds in California, Florida, South Carolina, and beyond. Mexico also yielded important fossils, including major collections at certain caves and open sites. These discoveries hint that dire wolves were not highly specialized in a single habitat, but rather could adapt to different settings if prey was available. In warmer tropical zones, they found animals like ground sloths and smaller camel species. In cooler latitudes, they pursued Pleistocene bison and horses. Although they seemed widespread, certain areas have fewer or no remains. For instance, dire wolf fossils are rarely identified above roughly 42 degrees north latitude. Possibly the colder climates or thick ice sheets of the north limited their spread or favored other predators. Surprisingly, one fossil from northeastern China, dated to around 40,000 years ago, has been proposed as a dire wolf. If true, it would mean these canids crossed the Bering Land Bridge into Asia. However, some researchers doubt this identification, arguing the fossils need more study. Still, the idea opens the possibility that dire wolves could travel wherever land connections and available prey existed. Yet their main stronghold appears to have been North and South America, where they lasted through much of the late Pleistocene. In North America, famous troves of dire wolf bones come from the Rancho La Brea tar pits in Los Angeles. This urban fossil site has yielded thousands of skeletons, reflecting how common the species was in that region. Other localities in the southwestern United States also show a strong presence, while eastern states hold plenty of remains for Enochian dirus dirus. This broad distribution reveals a predator able to handle varied climates and landscapes. Wherever large herbivores roamed, the dire wolf likely followed, carving out a place atop the food chain. Prey, hunting strategies and ecological role. Dire wolves thrived in the late Pleistocene, a time rich in megafauna. Giant ground sloths, camels, bison, mastodons, and ancient horses all shared the landscape. By examining dire wolf bone chemistry, Scientists learned they preyed heavily on grazing animals. Horses in particular show up in isotopic studies as a common meal. Although they did not ignore other targets, these canids were not fussy. They seemed to grab chances whenever large animals appeared weak, injured, or trapped. In some sites, dire wolf bones lie alongside those of mammoths or mastodons, suggesting occasional scavenging of enormous carcasses. A pack of dire wolves might start a hunt by spreading out and corralling a large herbivore. Some individuals could nip at the flanks while others rushed in for a decisive bite. Their powerful jaws let them cling to thrashing prey. Fossil evidence reveals frequent tooth damage, meaning these hunts were not easy. Big prey could deliver dangerous kicks or gore with horns. Yet by working together, dire wolves increased their odds of success. In many ways, they likely resembled modern gray wolves chasing bison, though the scale of the Pleistocene world was larger. Research on toothwear also suggests dire wolves ate quickly and consumed a lot of bone. 
competition from other Pleistocene predators, such as Smilodon and the American lion, forced them to eat fast before being challenged or driven away. The La Brea tar pits highlight this tension. Numerous carnivore species died while trying to claim the same trapped prey. Dire wolves appear as the most common large canid at that site, possibly outcompeting smaller coyotes and holding their ground against bigger cats in group confrontations. As top predators, dire wolves influenced herbivore populations by controlling weaker members. Their presence would have shaped the dynamics of Pleistocene ecosystems, keeping certain animals in check and opening scavenging niches for smaller creatures. In stable times, a balance was maintained. But near the end of the Ice Age, changes in climate and vegetation disrupted these interactions. Many big animals went extinct, removing a vital food source for dire wolves. Still, for much of their reign, these canids played a central part in the complex tapestry of life, extinction, legacy, and modern scientific insights. The dire wolf vanished from the fossil record around 9,500 years ago, near the close of the last major Ice Age. Many blame the disappearance of large prey animals for this collapse. As climates warmed and habitats shifted, the big herbivores that dire wolves relied on either migrated north, declined drastically, or died out entirely. Humans also arrived in North America thousands of years before, and their hunting could have reduced mega-herbivore numbers. Whatever the cause, the result was a sudden drop in the dire wolf's main food supply. Some have suggested disease or direct conflict with humans, but there is little solid proof. Another factor might have been the dire wolf's inability to adapt its diet to smaller creatures. Gray wolves, with more flexible feeding habits, survived by shifting to deer or smaller game. Dire wolves, specialized for bigger prey, may have struggled to sustain large pack sizes when bison and horses became scarce. If they tried to switch, competition with rising gray wolf populations could have driven them into less favorable areas, further stressing their numbers. Modern research has shed more light on this mystery. Radiocarbon dating of bones from La Brea and other sites places dire wolves right up to the cusp of the Holocene, meaning they survived into relatively recent times. DNA analyses confirm they had no recent mixing with coyotes or gray wolves, denying them any helpful genetic traits that might have emerged in canids from other parts of the world. Their lineage remained pure, but that purity likely turned into a disadvantage when rapid environmental changes arrived. We have journeyed through the dire wolf's history, from its earliest fossils to the final days of the Pleistocene. Though it shared the land with famous creatures like the mammoth, it carved its place as a formidable and specialized predator. Modern science reveals the dire wolf as a separate lineage, bound by convergent forms yet marked by unique traits. Its story reminds us that even the mightiest can fall. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to watch our next one, shown on screen.